casting, so that's why I'm, but I've always been, as some people who've long-term attendees of the China Environment Forum, I like starting at nine, because I want to honor all of you who arrived at nine, and, and also the folks, I know that there's some people out in Golden, Colorado at the, at NREL, who, they're big Joanna Lewis fans, I think, and they wanted to see you, Joanna, so they're here. So, so greetings to everyone else really? who is out in Webland, and also the people who, well, you didn't have to slog through rain and slush today, at least, so I'm really glad you made it. Um, my name is Jennifer Turner, and I have a few new faces, so subjected to the intro, so sorry. But yeah, you were at the Woodrow Wilson Center. In case you, this, is, this is the plane you didn't want to get on, you must get off now. Um, yeah, the Woodrow Wilson Center, we've been here for, um, since 1968. We're a creation of Congress as a memorial to Woodrow Wilson. And um, you know, being a policymaker and a scholar, we at the Wilson Center, the different programs, oops, just a minute. Some, is that mine? Oh. There's a cricket. <laughs> <laughs> It was like the cricket said, boring intro, boring intro. <laughs> yep. So the Wilson Center, we've been around since 1968, and we've got a scholar program. We also have a, um, about 20 plus po programs here that focus on foreign policy issues. The China Environment Forum has been around for 15 years, and I've been hanging my hat here for 13, doing lots of work on, initially a lot on water and NGOs, and of course have to do a lot of work on energy. And Funny thing is, when I first started, I have to say this, Joanna, because we, we reviewed it this morning, that when I was in, I, in 2000, I met Joanna Lewis when she was a grad student out at um, Berkeley and working on wind power. And I said, that's cool, because there wasn't really much wind power stuff happening back then. It wasn't really, it wasn't making the headlines here. And, and just last year, she was here at the Wilson Center as one of our fellows. So it's good. And she actually, while she was here, she did lots of writing and helped produce a book. So you're here to, today. Joanna's going to talk to you about um, her book on wind power industry in China. But it's, it's not just a narrow talk. It's actually very global because we have other speakers, other commentators here that are going to take us from you know, looking at the wind power industry and you know, why it's important, but also why it's important for U.S.-China relations. I've got a new friend, Levy Tilleman, who is a special advisor for policy and international affairs at the DOE. And he advises the DOE on policy and international affairs with a focus on clean energy transportation in East Asia, and um, did his just recently completed a dissertation on electric vehicles in China. And I already hit him up for the fact that, hey, if you make it a book, you could come and give a talk. You know, so. But, um, but you're going you're gonna to talk about like, why, why this wind power stuff and clean energy is important to the DOE, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about U.S.-China relations and scientific cooperation and its place in U.S.-China relations. OK. And within that, somehow, yeah. Joanna stuff. It's like she doesn't know her speakers. It's so bad. And, Banning Garrett, an old friend, and I have no idea when I started meeting you. I think we very long time ago. Very long time ago, mucked around in China on study tours and things. He's the director of Atlantic Council's Strategic Foresight Initiative. And he directs the SFI's long-term cooperation with the National Intelligence um, Council. Gosh, I'm just not enough caffeine this morning. Um, in production of Nick's unclassified long-term global trends assessments. A lot of you probably looked at, or at least the summary, he's got some here, of, of the NICS global assessment. And I was particularly excited, though, that it talked a lot about water issues. Um, but um, his comments that follow we'll wait up. Wait and see, right? What, wait and see, who knows? But I think his comments kind of drawing on some, some interesting work that, that you've been engaging with Chinese about China doing their own kind of global tens, trends assessments. And doing one together. And doing one together with the United States, seeing that US, China, yeah. We're the big dogs on the planet with energy. So I've rambled on enough, making little sense most likely. But um, welcome all of you here. I know more people will be trailing in. And Joanna, do you want the mic to stand or are you going to sit? Can you all see me from here? I think we have a pretty intimate room, so I'll, I'll start sitting at least. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, so today I plan to talk a little bit about um, my new book. I won't try to go through the entire book, but uh, you're certainly welcome to take a look at it if you'd be interested. Uh, today I'm going to focus on a few key questions that the book tries to address. Um, today I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about why, why China, why I'm looking at China in the context of this book, um, which both in terms of China's role in global climate change as well as the increasing role that China's playing in innovation. Um, and innovation in green technologies in particular. Uh, I'm then going to take you through how China acquired wind energy technology. So what the book is really looking at is uh, what the role was of foreign firms in transferring technology to China, 
um, the types of intellectual property, uh, structural relationships that were set up between these companies and the technology transfers, uh, and then the domestic policies within China that helped to facilitate uh, the technology development. Um, I'll then briefly talk about how what China did is, is similar to or different from the strategies of other emerging economies, other latecomer uh, firms that have uh, moved into wind energy and, and to other technologies, and what China did well, what maybe they did not so well, um, and then talk about what China has been able to achieve in the wind technology sector. So where are they now? Um, you know, what have they really been able to accomplish in terms of technological improvements, uh, cost reductions, and then maybe other ways that we try to measure learning and uh, progress in, in technology development, um, new innovations, et cetera. Uh, and then I'll wrap with a, a few thoughts on why this all matters, um, put it into somewhat broader context, um, both in terms of how we think about the need to scale up low carbon technologies, particularly in emerging economies and in the developing world, um, what this means as we start to look at the increasing innovative capacity of the emerging economies and how we think about where innovation and new technologies is likely to occur over the next few decades. Um, and then what this might mean also for U.S. competitiveness. Um, of course, there's a lot of attention right now to the sort of U.S.-China dynamic in developing clean technologies, particularly as relates to uh, industrial policy, recent WTO disputes. Um, and then, of course, the U.N. climate negotiations are another place where technology transfer has long been discussed, and, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how some of these findings could potentially help to inform uh, those negotiations as well. Um, so just to give a, a little bit of context, I know this is a very informed audience on China, um, but of course China is uh, the largest national emitter of climate change on an annual basis, responsible for roughly a quarter of uh, carbon dioxide emissions from energy, fossil fuel emissions. Um, and of course, why we are particularly interested in China's uh, carbon emissions is not because so much where they are today, but where they might be in the future. Uh, China's growth rates for carbon emissions have been uh, extremely rapid in the last five years or so and are, depending what what happens going forward, uh, uh, EIA, for example, predicts that about uh, almost half of all new CO2 emissions globally emitted between 2010 and 2035 uh, may come from China. So this is a very uh, sizable uh, contribution to our uh, future uh, emissions picture and so what China, of course, does in terms of deploying low carbon technologies is going to be uh, potentially crucial in, in what this curve looks like. Um, and then, um, of course, I'm going to be talking about wind energy, and I, I don't look at wind energy in this book as China's saving grace for all its environmental problems or climate change problems, so I want to make that point up front. Um, you know, I think that wind has a very important role to play in China. Right now, it's 6% uh, of installed electric capacity, um, as you can see from this chart, broken out by fuel. That translates into uh, a little over 1% of electricity generation, so really small uh, contribution right now to China's total energy mix. Uh, China still gets about two-thirds of total primary energy uh, from coal, almost 80% of electricity still. Um, but wind is the third largest source of electricity in China behind coal and hydropower. Uh, there's actually more electricity coming from wind than from nuclear, um, although some problems with curtailment, which I'll, I'll talk about a bit later, which have made that number a bit lower recently. Um, so wind is not going to replace coal in China anytime soon, um, but I look at it because what they've been able to do in wind has, I think, implications for what they may be able to do in transitioning to other low carbon technologies um, going forward. And of course, today, clean energy is now a, a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, this is no longer small, uh, small potatoes in terms of investment dollars. Um, it's a, at least a 60 to 70 billion dollar industry, and in fact, if you actually include all investment flows, including R&D, um, various undisclosed deals, by some metrics, that number gets up to closer to 250 billion dollars invested in clean energy in 2011, which actually would be uh, larger than uh, traditional energy sector investments that same year, fossil energy, et cetera. Um, so this is no longer, you know, a niche industry. And emerging economies are playing an increasingly important role in this investment, as well as in innovation in these technologies. So um, again, just to break down those numbers I just gave you on total investment on the left here, you can see that China's share of um, total investment in clean energy has been rapidly increasing over the last decade. China 
Um, the updated figures, I believe, for 2012 puts it still uh, far ahead of the U.S. in terms of total energy investments, although China and the U.S. have sort of been vying for uh, the largest investors in clean energy over the last uh, few years. Um, and then emerging economies also, um, and this is relatively new uh, phenomenon, have been playing an increasingly important role in innovation. This is a chart showing patents um, in renewable energy technologies. Patents are not actually a great measure of innovation, particularly in the Chinese context. But um, even just using this metric, you can see China. This is These are the top five countries in terms of patenting activity in renewables uh, filed under the International uh, PCT Treaty. Um, and so China's fifth behind Korea, Germany, Japan, and the US. So this is a relatively new thing to see Korea and, and China in this top five. Um, and then I think something that's really interesting is that wind energy in China represents the largest clean energy investment in any single technology in any country in the world anywhere. Uh, so this is not something I could say back when I started studying wind energy in China, back when I met Jennifer, um, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, this is a, a relatively new phenomenon, but the investments that we're seeing going into wind energy in China are extremely, extremely large and larger the investments than, the, you know, the entire European Union are putting into wind and solar on an annual basis. Um, and you can see this is a phenomenon that's been true just relatively just in the last couple of years and, and has continued uh, in recent years as well. So I want to take you back to uh, 2003. Um, this is the year I was actually living in, in China, doing some works on the wind industry there. And at that time, there were very few Chinese firms in the wind power industry. Um, and primarily, the wind turbine manufacturers that were there were big global players. So um, you had the largest market share was actually a company called NEG Micon, which no longer exists. They were a Danish wind turbine manufacturer that uh, right around this time got acquired by Vestas, taken over and um, absorbed into the Vestas company. And NEG Micon had a very large operation in China at that time. Um, and when Vestas actually took them over, Vestas being um, at that point the largest, uh, when uh, had the largest market share in the global market, they still do. Uh, as far as I know, I haven't seen the most recent data, but this is a you know, big historic player coming out of Denmark. Um, but when Vestas acquired Energy Micon, which had this large China presence, they actually opted to shut down most of its China operations and start its own, um, its own uh, presence in China. Uh, I mention this just because this sort of thing had implications for the development of the Chinese market. This happened at a pretty pivotal time. Um, as China was just starting to get off the ground in wind development, and you actually had an interesting situation where many of the people who had been working for NEG Micon uh, across China uh, that got let go by Vestas during the merger ended up starting their own wind companies, starting their own consulting businesses, um, many people I still work with today. So this was an interesting way in which sort of knowledge moved into the Chinese wind industry through a sort of a simple uh, merger acquisition uh, that took place. And there are many other cases of this sort of thing. This is one illustration of something that happened. Um, so th you can see from this pie chart on the left, again, the only real uh, Chinese manufacturer that had significant market share at this time was Goldwind. Uh, Jinfeng, this is uh, one of the still top three Chinese wind turbine manufacturers today, a company I look a lot at in my book because they really were the first mover in terms of a Chinese-owned uh, wind turbine manufacturer. Um, and then you can see on, in the right, in terms of the foreign uh, leading companies that were around uh, in 2003, um, there were a couple of them that were not yet in the Chinese market at this time. Most of the big ones were already over there, starting to uh, move into that market primarily through importing wind turbines from wherever they were manufacturing in their home countries primarily. Uh, GE, one company that wasn't yet in China, but this was the year that they were actually just starting to move into China. GE was a relative latecomer to the wind industry compared to these other uh, firms you see here. They got involved uh, right around the time that they acquired uh, Enron, um, and then uh, it took a few years to sort of decide how to, to move into this uh, industry. So GE wasn't there. Enercon, a big German uh, manufacturer, had opted to never go into China for various reasons, um, I think, concerning uh, uh, worries they had about their technology. Um, uh, going there, they, they use a relatively uh, novel technology. Gamesa, Spanish firm, um, it was already in China, and then some of these others were there in, in other capacities, which I'll talk about. So um, I won't go too much into detail here. There's a lot I want to cover, but the book goes into some case studies of these different foreign firms that were in the Chinese market and looks at how their strategies 
uh, as relates to technology, development technology transfer in the context of the Chinese wind industry evolved over time, over roughly a decade, um, as they you know, first started to go in there, uh, primarily importing technology, and then eventually moved to locally manufacturing their technology there, and whether or not they opted to transfer technology in, in, a, in any uh, particular way. So the companies I look at are listed here. Um, Vestas, that includes sort of all the other companies involved with Vestas, including Energy Micon, uh, Nordex, a big German firm, GE, Goldwind, as I mentioned, and then um, Suzlam, which I'll talk about, uh, is the largest Indian wind turbine manufacturer, which I think has some interesting parallels with Goldwind in terms of both how they de developed their technology in the Indian context and how they, they worked within the Chinese context. Um, so over time, these companies sort of had different ways that they um, they transitioned through the Chinese market. I won't go into this in much detail, but what the book does is I use a lot of charts like this to try to show um, you know, the different ways that IP and, and information is moving between companies in China. So um, just to give a, you know, a quick illustration of what you see here, I'll, I'll take the GE case, for example. Um, you know, GE, the IP that is in the wind turbines that you can buy from GE today is actually um, based on a sort of many, many decades of U.S. wind turbine manufacturers going all the way back to uh, companies like U.S. Wind Power, Kenetech in the 1980s that were active in the California market. These are all companies that sort of merged and were acquired by other companies, Zond. Uh, Tacky, a German company, eventually was acquired by Enron, and then Enron was acquired by GE. This is sort of a simplistic uh, this, you know, summary of what happened, but essentially you, know, you, you can trace a lot of the knowledge in today's wind turbine technology from the main manufacturers, which you see here on the bottom of this chart, to their origins and places that took place. Um, and then within the Chinese context, their spin-offs, joint ventures, other things that they opted to do, uh, and implications that had for technology transfer. Um, so as I mentioned, when these foreign firms all entered the Chinese market, um, they were primarily importing their technology to China. Um, but there was an evolving policy framework, of course, that was you know, being developed right around this time um, that ended up influencing the way that these firms operated in the Chinese context. So for example, um, as early as 1997, there was a, a program called the Ride the Wind program, which was the first time the Chinese government directly encouraged two Sinovoran joint ventures in the wind power industry. Um, this was actually uh, the, the German firm Nordex, which I look at in the book, was one of the companies that was selected to take place, uh, to take part of this program. Um, and in doing so, they transferred, a, I believe it was a 600 kilowatt wind turbine model to their Chinese partner in Xi'an. Um, at the same time they set up this joint venture, they were continuing to import wind turbines straight from Germany and compete uh, with their joint venture in that context. So you had these sort of different ways in parallel uh, which they were uh, entering the Chinese market. They also then opted to eventually set up their own uh, manufacturing facility uh, under Nordex's name in China as well. Uh, other, pro other policies that were important, uh, so right around 2003, the time I was just talking about, this is when China first launched their uh, wind concession program. This was the first large-scale wind development program in China where the government would set aside, uh, I think it was 100 megawatt uh, concessions of land. There would be an auction to develop this project um, and a, a, a price set for the eventual tariff for that project based on the prices bid by the companies. Um, this was the first real signal from the government that they were going to do these large-scale wind projects. Um, although 100 megawatt is not very large scale these days, uh, by the time we got to 2009, they were looking at 10 gigawatt scale wind bases in China. So these are the largest wind farms being developed anywhere in the world. Uh, 10 gigawatts is an extremely large wind farm. And uh, also this year, 2009, is when uh, feed-in tariffs for wind were established in China, which set a, a much more stable pricing signal uh, around the country and uh, was real, really, you know, I think the the trigger for a lot of the really big development we've seen just in the last three years or so. Um, so you had um, this situation where uh, these different companies were moving into the Chinese market. They were sort of reconsidering how they were going to uh, handle intellectual property, local manufacturing, where their turbine was going to be designed, and, and who was going to be owning them. And I should just briefly mention that one policy that I talk quite a bit about in the book is the local content requirement. Um, this is something that uh, really started to have an effect on what was happening in China around 2003 in these wind concessions I mentioned, where um, 
technology firms that were participating in the concessions, so wind turbine manufacturers that were providing wind turbines for these projects had to meet um, a local content requirement, started at a 50%. Um, so 50% essentially of the turbine by value had to be sourced domestically within China. Um, you were basically awarded points within the context of the bid based on to the extent that you could meet these local content requirements. That was raised to 70%. Um, and these were, you know, they're part of the bidding criteria. There was never sort of a, a national top-down policy that mandated this, although it sort of materialized in different ways. Um, and then by 2009, um, you actually had a situation where then Commerce Secretary Locke traveled to China as part of a, a U.S.-China bilateral trade discussion and, and asked China to remove these local content requirements on wind specifically. And, and at that point, they did. Um, but also by that point, they had essentially served their purpose <laughs> because at that point, you actually had a situation where all of the foreign firms that were involved in the Chinese market had already moved their local uh, wind turbine manufacturing to China, and at that point you had a very different situation in terms of the Chinese manufacturers in the market, which I'll talk about in a moment. So, you know, this is really only the beginning of the story in terms of thinking about technology transfer in the wind industry in China. Um, at this point, all foreign-owned wind, wind turbine companies had moved their manufacturing to China for the Chinese market. Um, very few uh, leading foreign wind turbine technology firms transferred their technology to Chinese firms directly. Um, and yet, we now are, you know, we have this market in China where Goldwind has since been joined by at least 30, in terms of 30 firms that have sold commercial wind turbines in China, Chinese-owned firms, and maybe as many as 80 or more uh, firms that have some type of wind turbine that's in some stage of development within China, um, Chinese-owned wind companies. So you have this, you know, real, uh, this, this completely different situation than you had just, a, you know, under a decade ago. So what happened? Um, so what I, <laughs> I know you want to, you want to see more charts like this, so I won't go through this in, in uh, excruciating detail, don't worry. I mean, we you might, can... <laughs> we'll, we'll be able to post this online in PDFs later. Yeah, or you can buy the book, you know. <laughs> or you can buy the book. Well, it's not in color in the book, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, every time I actually give this talk, I often make modifications to this to reflect uh, to new developments. But essentially, you know, the circle here is pointing you to Goldwind and where Goldwind fits in terms of this web of um, technology and intellectual property, which is moving across firms within China, across Europe, and throughout other emerging economies as well. Um, and so what I do in the book is look at sort of, again, this is, you know, just to give you a sense, this is a list of uh, multiple Chinese wind turbine manufacturers which now exist, uh, the model of technology transfer they used um, to get their technology, and the source of the technology. So where it came from, did it come from a firm, did it come from a university, did it come from, uh, you know, uh, where, wherever else it came from. And so using this, I develop essentially three models to talk about technology transfer in the Chinese context. Um, there's really sort of three general models which emerge that can explain most of the sources of technology development. The first is licensing. This is a very traditional way uh, to transfer technology, essentially where a you know, Chinese firm purchases a license from a foreign firm. Uh, this allows them to usually uh, develop a specific wind turbine model with specific regulations surrounding that. Um, the advantages of this model is that the firm acquires a technology that has been field tested. It's usually something that's already been used elsewhere. It's, it's, a, it's a developed uh, model of technology. The risks are that if a firm is willing to license their technology to a Chinese company, um, it's probably because it's, it's maybe an older, a smaller model. It might be an outdated model. Um, or even if it isn't, they may put restrictions on the intellectual property use. So if you're a Chinese firm just selling within China, that's OK. But if you have aspirations to then export outside of China, maybe your license will restrict your ability to do that in the future. Um, and then usually these are non-exclusive licenses. So others can license that same technology. And in fact, um, that's what we see happening quite a bit, as I'll, I'll show you uh, in a moment. Um, the second model, mergers and acquisitions. So I, as I mentioned earlier, there's already been many, many mergers and acquisitions within wind turbine uh, manufacturers around the world. Um, and this is true also as a model of technology transfer that China has used. Uh, the advantage of this being, of course, if a Chinese firm just purchases outright majority control of another wind turbine manufacturer or design firm, engineering firm, they obtain control of the intellectual property associated with that company. But um, the downside is that we, this doesn't always work as well as you would think because of um, 
differences in the way that the firms do business or if you don't necessarily have the capacity to integrate this new knowledge. Um, even cultural differences can, can be a barrier to, to their ability to do this. Um, and then the third model is, is what I call sort of joint development. And this is a, a model that essentially is when you have a Chinese company working jointly with a foreign firm um, to develop a new, a new type of wind turbine model, some type of new intellectual property. Um, it could be a totally new innovation, incremental innovation. Um, the advantage of this being that you know, you, you're sorting out the IP uh, ownership rules up front. Um, and the downside of this is that what you often see happening, particularly in the Chinese context, would be a firm in China that had a lot of manufacturing experience partnering with, for example, a German design firm um, that had a lot of design and engineering experience, not as much manufacturing deployment experience. And so when these two come together, you didn't always have um, sort of perfect information sharing across the two. But this, this is a model that ended up working in, in several scenarios. So. Um, just briefly to talk a little bit about Goldwind and, and to compare it to Suzlon, the Indian firm, um, I think these are interesting cases to talk about. Um, and in the book, I look at Goldwind and then look at them uh, together because they both were leading manufacturers in their home country markets. They both began manufacturing wind turbines around the same time. Um, so these were the big, you know, Chinese and Indian wind turbine manufacturers started to get into the sector in the early 1990s. Uh, they both used licenses um, to get started. They licensed a model of uh, wind turbine technology, uh, Suzlon from a German firm, Goldwind as well, uh, from a firm, uh, Repower originally, it had been uh, called Jacobs. Um, but then as they became more sophisticated, they became larger companies, they had more experience in the sector, um, they both uh, decided to uh, acquire certain companies, they went through mergers and acquisitions. Um, so, for example, Suzlon at one point acquired one of the leading U.S. gearbox manufacturers to bring that uh, information and, and learning knowledge into their own uh, business practices. Um, they also acquired a, a German firm, Repower, which, is you remember, was actually the firm that had licensed technology to Goldwind at the beginning of, of their uh, process. <laughs> and uh, Goldwind collaborated quite a bit with a German firm called Vensus. They, they acquired majority control of them when they had an outside uh, takeover offer and now do actually joint technology development with this company. Um, and so you also see another thing I, I look at in the book is to the extent to which these companies were involved in what I'm calling sort of global learning networks, the, the extent to which they had access to a, a global uh, set of, of, of knowledge that informs their own business practices back in their home country. So Suzlon was a company that was very um, outwardly oriented in terms of their um, they were doing R&D all around the world. When they had the opportunity to set up an international headquarters, they opted to put this in uh, a city in Denmark where um, actually it, was the, it had been the previous headquarters of NEG Micon, and when they went bankrupt, they actually again were able to, um, I think, hire a lot of the workers that had been let go and incorporate again the, the skilled labor force into their own company. Um, Goldwyn was much more limited in their uh, global presence from the outset, although more recently they have expanded globally. Uh, they now, uh, are in the U.S., are headquartered out of Chicago. They have a U.S. CEO. Um, they're expanding in Australia as well, and they're starting to think about doing um, uh, sort of more than just sales, uh, but more technology development in these markets as well. So. Taking you back to this, you know, you can see, <laughs> again, that you have, um, you know, Suzlon and Goldwyn are actually connected, you know, not just sort of in their story and their, their technology evolution, but there's many similarities in uh, where their intellectual property is coming from. And um, the companies circled here are, I think, interesting because these are the foreign firms. Um, you've got four German firms and, and one U.S. firm. Um, American Superconductor, many of you may have heard of, that are actually involved in licensing or um, some other type of technology transfer with multiple firms in China and or in other emerging economies around the world. Um, so you can see, for example, uh, Vensys down in the, uh, the bottom left corner here. You remember this is the company I mentioned Goldwind uh, works with and, and actually owns. Um, but Vensys has licensed their technology to firms in Argentina, Spain, Czech Republic, Brazil, India. Um, so this is this non-exclusive license issue I mentioned earlier. And, and you actually have this situation where a lot of the kind of next generation wind companies, emerging economies from around the world are, are using um, sort of common <laughs> sources of, of technology, intellectual property, and know-how as they uh, are moving into the wind industry. This has implications for the technology going forward. And Korea, um, which I won't talk about today, um, you know, has very similar 
uh, situation happening within the Korean firms, although the firms in Korea that are now getting into the wind industry are, are not tiny little firms. They're big conglomerates that you've heard of, Hyundai, uh, you know, Daewoo, even Samsung. Um, but they're using very similar models of technology development, nonetheless, of technology transfer to because they're latecomers. If, if China's a latecomer, um, you know, country, these companies are latecomer countries to the wind industry, Korea is a late, late comer, right? They, they, they are getting involved in this much later than China and India. Um, so what has China been able to achieve? I'm sure many of you are already familiar with the Chinese success story as relates to wind, but their installed capacity has been, um, th this is China in red, you see here, and it's just been exponential over the last um, essentially decade. And, and for 2012, these are estimated figures. Uh, they, are, they are still uh, very much on top in terms of uh, global installed wind power capacity. Um, you've seen the emergence of many new Chinese manufacturers, as I mentioned. Um, so along with this installed capacity has been many new entrants into the market, although you're starting to finally see some consolidation there. Um, and then a huge gain in market share. So back in 2004, um, all the Chinese wind turbine manufacturers, which was essentially Goldwind at that time, had about a quarter of market share, if you remember, in, in the Chinese market today, or in, in 2010, um, they had about 90% of market share in the Chinese market. So there's been a real evolution um, in this industry. Um, and you've seen costs start to come down um, in wind as well. It's, uh, you know, this is sort of, these are the actual prices that we are seeing for the wind concessions, wind-based projects, which are not perfect. Um, me measures of cost decline. Um, I think there's been a fair amount of gaming, for example, in the wind concession market, which makes the prices not the best uh, measure of, of actual cost. But I think in these more recent years, you've seen the similar trend, both for the foreign-owned and Chinese-owned wind turbine, um, wind turbines being sold within the Chinese market, a similar sort of declining trend, which I think is more reflective of um, the actual declining costs. Um, and then in terms of technological progress, one way to measure this would be in terms of average annual wind turbine size. Uh, it's not a perfect measure, but wind turbines, you know, have been getting larger and larger over time. And you can see that, for example, back in 99, um, the average uh, wind turbine size being installed in China annually was just about 610 kilowatts. Um, but by 2009, the average size was uh, well over one megawatt. Um, so the, you know, the average size has been going in. And of course, over this time, this is exactly when you had Chinese wind turbine manufacturers also getting majority uh, share of the market. So this is primarily uh, their, their wind turbines going in. So you've seen large scale domestic expansion around China. You've seen a lot of manufacturing hubs uh, popping up in the same places where you've got a lot of wind development taking place. Um, but at this point, pretty limited overseas expansion. I think we um, many people assume that China is exporting wind turbines all over the world at this point. That's true for solar, of course. That's the, the story we've been hearing with the solar industry, but it's actually not yet true for wind. Uh, they're exporting some components, um, but the total wind technology uh, export value um, were worth just over $100 million in 2010. This has you know, gone up a little bit, but um, it's not a huge export industry for China yet, although it, it may eventually get there. Um, so I just want to end with a few sort of general thoughts on this. Or am I okay? For you're time? good. Okay. <laughs> They're looking. Happy I know I talk there. fast. I apologize, um, but I'm happy to take questions if, if I you know ran through anything quickly later. Um, so some key findings. I think that um, one thing this shows is that substantial technical advances are indeed possible in relatively short amounts of time. Right. It took China as well as India and South Korea less than 10 years to go from having no experience in the wind technology sector to being able to manufacture complete wind systems. Um, I think this also shows that when we look at, we sort of think about models of technology transfer that might be replicable elsewhere, um, licensing in this technology in the sector is a relatively inexpensive way to acquire knowledge, um, although its future potential is limited due to the restrictions that often surround licensing. Um, I think that, you know, and, and of course you have this situation where licenses frequently come from the same companies, they're not exclusive, and, and the implications associated with that. Um, and also I think tapping into these global learning networks and, and broader, uh, you know, global ex ways of doing innovation in multiple countries with multiple players can be highly valuable. I think Gold, uh, sorry, Suzlon. Uh, the Indian firm really experienced this um, and was very strategically positioned because of its global subsidiaries and its base of industry knowledge, you know, that was spread around the world. And 
Goldwyn really, I think, recognizes this value and has been moving increasingly in that direction. Um, Goldwyn is a partially state-owned firm. Um, you know, large Chinese state-owned firms tend to be more inwardly focused, less, um, less you know, integrated in sort of global market, global supply chains. But I think that is starting to change in wind and in other sectors as well. Um, and then, and then you see similar things happening in Korea. Um, Korea, of course, now, as I mentioned, a, a late, late comer into this uh, industry, the firms there, but they are jumping straight to um, highly advanced wind turbine technology, particularly offshore technology, um, partly because that might be what makes sense for Korea, but also because this is a market where they think they can compete with, with Chinese and other wind turbine manufacturers. Um, so I think this shows that technology transfers are occurring via commercial channels. Everything I've just described to you, you know, the government may have played a peripheral role, but these are primarily commercial transactions. Um, that doesn't mean there's not still an important role for governments to play, both in, uh, particularly in, in domestic policy. Um, and I think one, w one place this really is playing out right now in the Chinese context um, as relates to wind is that, you know, you have this situation where there's now a lot of wind turbine manufacturers in China, there's a lot of wind turbines, but um, not a lot of information about technology quality. Um, there's an increasing push from the government to set up independent testing and certification bodies to really get out better information on the wind turbines to actually make them go through quality um, standards, regulations, and also um, there's a real, I think, need for improvements in operation and maintenance of the wind farms. Of course, they have a lot of wind capacity up and running, but as many of you may have heard, um, there's uh, huge problems with integration uh, of the wind farms into the overall power grid, uh, curtailment from wind, I think, uh, responsible for uh, was well over a billion dollars of losses last year um, because you unfortunately have the situation where you're integrating, you know, some of the best wind resources are in Inner Mongolia, for example. Um, Inner Mongolia, the, the eastern part of the Inner Mongolia grid is, is interconnected with the Beijing <laughs> region, so there's a lot of demand, but this is a place with cold winters. It's a primarily coal-based grid a lot of combined heat and power, and you actually need to be running the, the CHP plants in the winter to get the heat. And so, you know, long story short, you end up curtailing a huge amount of wind, um, wasting this low carbon electricity. And that's not, um, if they can't sell the actual kilowatt hours into the grid, the developers aren't getting the feed in tariff, and so they're losing money. Um, and this is really a part of the situation that's happening. So there's, you know, multiple stories that are, that are happening in the wind industry in China. Um, and then also, I think, you know, another situation we're seeing in, in, in the policy environment is that a lot of the policies that have been aimed at encouraging technology transfers or subsidizing renewable energy even um, are starting to run into direct conflict with WTO agreements, different international trade regulations, particularly local content requirements, which are essentially no longer used in China but are used still in many countries around the world. Um, including uh, industrialized countries. This is not just something that developing countries are doing. Canada, for example, um, is currently subject to a WTO dispute where uh, Japan and other countries are, um, are, are concerned about their uh, local content requirement as part of their feed and tariff to support wind and solar there. Um, and I think there are much larger barriers to accessing the knowledge necessary to develop next generation sort of pre-commercial and potentially disruptive technologies. So I think this is sort of an important point to end on in that um, I've been discussing, you know, wind power technology is a relatively mature technology. It's, it's commercially available. Um, when we start to look at models of technology transfer barriers to technology development in pre-commercial technologies, there's a total, you know, there can be very different sets of concerns related to intellectual property particularly. Um, and particularly into doing joint development, joint R&D um, at that stage. And so I think that, um, you know, there's, there's discussions in sort of how you can better facilitate technology transfer in this realm of technologies as well in the framework uh, convention discussions, the climate convention. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about compulsory licensing and the role that this could play. You know, should we be actually, uh, you know, handing out licenses, uh, free licenses for, um, uh, low carbon technology to the developing world to facilitate its deployment more rapidly, right? But, you know, there's real concerns about the, um, the, the blowback this could have on innovation if you aren't protecting intellectual property and, and providing this, um, you know, this uh, at, at least uh, payback time uh, over a certain amount of years. So I think that um, 
you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing now is looking at these, uh, what I would call sort of cross-national innovation frameworks, ways that governments can come together and try to promote collaborative R&D in some of these uh, next generation technologies, which we'll need, particularly in clean energy, uh, and particularly with China. Um, but China, of course, being the country where, you know, a lot of firms have concerns still about intellectual property, and I think there is a role for governments to play in making sure that the environment in which uh, these joint uh, technology developments and, and collaborations are taking place is is one in which firms are are confident that they um, you know they will be able to move forward that their IP will be protected and that um, the the outputs of their innovation will also uh, be protected as well. So um, I will stop there. We have two other panelists that have I'm sure a lot of fascinating things to say, but I look forward to your questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so so Levi, she teed you up really well. Because, yes. um, you know, a lot of people in the China Environment Forum know we were all jumping up and down in excitement in 2009 with the Obama Who Clean Energy Agreements. And, you know, kind of, a, you know, a lot of us, you know, the, the China watchers looking at, wow, this is a, a new kind of way, you know, U.S. and China working together on cleaner coal, renewables, and also integrating the business community. So you got it. Uh, thank you very Tell much. Tell us more. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. That was a stimulating discussion of China's wind technology and uh, its innovation ecosystem there. I actually did my PhD on Chinese electric vehicles, and it was a comparative study between China, Japan, and the United States, and how our innovation policies were succeeding or failing in that sector. And my analysis came out slightly less sanguine than your analysis um, on the wind industry. Um, but today, I'm going to be speaking as representative of the Department of Energy on Chinese-U.S. science and technology cooperation. I'm going to be reading a 20-minute speech, so get your coffee ready. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start But be by, you know, a little yeah, lively I'll, I'll, inflections yeah, lively, in there. Yeah. Good, good. Um, so I am going to start uh, by discussing some of the origins of U.S.-China science and technology cooperation. Then I'm going to discuss some of the history and scope of China-U.S. science and technology cooperation. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about present day industries and how U.S. s and agreements apply to that relationship today. Um, so in July 1971, Henry Kissinger executed one of the most memorable diplomatic maneuvers in history. The president's national security advisor traveled to Pakistan, feigned illness, and then flew into China under cover of darkness to open discussions with a hostile regime the United States had never recognized. The People's Republic of China, a totalitarian state, represented values profoundly different than our own. It was committed to geopolitical objectives, including control of Taiwan, that the US government found deeply objectionable. It is difficult today to appreciate the political and diplomatic hurdles Kissinger faced in re-engaging China. In fact, there's a great story about when two diplomats from the United States tried to approach their Chinese counterparts in Warsaw at a Yugoslav talent show. They, uh, actually no, a fashion show, not a talent <laughs> show. They saw, them, they saw them across the room and they were attempting to approach them. And when the Chinese diplomats saw their US counterparts coming towards them, they started to walk away because they didn't want to come into contact with the US diplomats. Then as the US uh, diplomats started to follow them and speed up their pace, the Chinese actually started to run away in order to <laughs> not make contact with their U.S. counterparts. <laughs> Yet, Nixon and Kissinger saw a strategic advantage in opening a dialogue with Mao Zedong and the Chinese regime. The Soviets were skirmishing with the Chinese and considering a preemptive strike on Chinese nuclear arsenals. America had decided that Russia was, in fact, the greater threat. So after months of what Kissinger later called a minuet so intricate that both sides could always claim they were not in contact, Kissinger's visit was the decisive diplomatic breakthrough. Eight years later, Nixon, Kissinger, and Mao were all gone, but the seeds they planted led to the normalization of relations between the US and China. In January 1979, the two countries agreed to collaborate on a broad range of science and technology research objectives including agriculture, energy, space, health, environment, earth sciences, and engineering, as well as education and scholarly exchange. In the years since, that cooperation has grown to encompass dozens of programs in diverse fields. 
Since those early days, the nature of the U.S.-China relationship has continually evolved. As the two countries have grown and changed, tensions in the relationship between the U.S. and China have also evolved. These are serious and profound. The People's Republic of China remains an authoritarian state with values that are very different from our own. The PRC still pursues the <coughs> political objectives we find deeply objectionable. It engages in practices, including espionage, cyber attacks, and intellectual property theft that threaten the United States' interests. So why do we cooperate? Because on balance, we believe that US-Chinese scientific collaboration remains overwhelmingly beneficial. But it is important to note that we will not hesitate to revise the terms of our cooperation with the PRC should this change. I'd like to now review some of the history and the scope of the US uh, China science and technology engagement. In the 1970s, America saw geostrategic benefits to strengthening China as a balance against the Soviets, and a little investment there could yield significant outcomes. Initial collaboration between these two powers was, in large part, focused on improving the capabilities of the Chinese. Accordingly, the U.S. signed its SMT agreement in January 1979. And at the same time, the Department of Energy also signed an agreement to implement cooperation in high energy physics with China's State Science and Technology Commission. Starting in 1984, U.S. scientists worked with Chinese counterparts to develop and build China's Beijing Positron Collider, which was hailed as one of the country's major scientific achievements. Then in 1986, we signed a protocol for R&D cooperation on nuclear physics and fusion. Over the 1980s, China's collaboration with the U.S. deepened. At the same time, leaders set their sights on building a more sophisticated R&D establishment. Indeed, in 1986, the country began an intensive national technology program named the 863 Project, after the month and the year, March 1986, when some of China's most respected scientists penned a letter to Deng Xiaoping warning that China was far behind its Western counterparts and needed to catch up. The 863 program was a vehicle for this ambition. But while China was trying to catch up, its lax treatment of intellectual property rights was also becoming a significant issue. In response to this, the US filed a 1991 addendum to the SMT agreement regarding IP rights. The aim of this revision was to explicitly codify the disposition of intellectual property developed by joint achievements. It would be naive to assume that this settled the question of intellectual property. However, it did specify ownership of IP in third countries, which was of some use. Over the subsequent decades, the DOE and its labs have, in many ways, been at the center of US-China SMT partnerships. Under the 1998 Peaceful Uses of Nuclear Technology Agreement, or PUNT Agreement, DOE has cooperated with China in areas of nuclear safety, sustainability of existing fleet of operating reactors, safeguards and security, environment and waste management, ener emergency management, and radiological source security. In 2000, the DOE and China's State Technology Commission, now the Ministry of Science and Technology, or MOST, concluded an agreement for cooperation on fossil energy technology development and utilization. And in 2006, an agreement on cooperation in energy efficiency and renewable energy technology development and utilization. In July 2009, DOE signed an agreement with China's Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development for cooperation in energy efficient buildings and communities. Then, in November that same year, the DOE signed a protocol with MOST and the National Energy Administration for cooperation on a clean energy research center, which we call CERC as part of the U.S.-China SMT agreement, and another MOU with China's National Energy Administration, establishing a U.S.-China Renewable Energy Partnership. This was followed by agreements with the Chinese Academy of Sciences for cooperation in energy sciences, and a U.S.-China agreement for cooperation in establishing a center for excellence on nuclear security, port security, and other nuclear cooperation. Again, these agreements were not merely altruistic. We have made a decision to engage with China because in many areas there are clear benefits for the U.S. Perhaps nowhere is this more apparent than in the nuclear field. 
Almost all of our objectives in U.S.-China engagement can be seen in the field of nuclear energy. China has the fastest growing nuclear fleet in the world. It has 15 operating nuclear reactors and 30 under construction, with plans for more on the books. China's nuclear expansion presents both an opportunity and indeed a threat. Westinghouse is working with China on the sale of 10 more reactors that could result in a procurement value of $25 billion. If China can grow its nuclear fleet while maintaining a high level of operational safety and prudently managing nuclear waste, nuclear energy could provide a clean, carbon-free source of electricity, an alternative to coal for China's growing economy. On the other hand, the figurative and literal fallout from a Chinese nuclear program gone awry could certainly reach the United States. Achieving tangible progress in, nu in nuclear safety and advanced R&D and leveraging resources are key goals for our cooperation. As part of PUNT, the NNSA is working with China's General Administration of Customs in constructing a radiation detection training center in Qingquadao to combat smuggling. The reasons are obvious. Should loose fissile materials exit China, our nation would be one likely destination. Indeed, NRC and NNSA are working so extensively with China that they have established a Shanghai office. We're collaborating to increase the safety of light water reactors as they age and are engaged in information exchange on high temperature <coughs> gas reactor operational safety and optimization. <coughs> on a more experimental level, U.S. scientists have worked with Chinese to design the experimental advanced superconducting tokamak in Hefei, China, with the goal of engaging in fusion research that could provide the basis for a clean, virtually limitless source of energy in the future. This is synergistic with other research the American scientists are engaged in around the world and allows us to gain valuable insights on fusion technology, as America has not built equivalent facilities at home. The U.S. and China are also participants in ITER, a large-scale fusion experiment under construction in France. ITER draws together not only the U.S. and China, but also governments representing about half of the world's population. China is also delving into other nuclear technology that is not currently supported in the U.S. So. One example of this is melted salt reactors that use thorium instead of uranium for fuel. While the U.S. is not currently pursuing thorium reactor technology, we are pursuing the development of fluoride salt-cooled high-temperature reactors, which again makes China's research into its own molten salt reactors potentially valuable. Other parts of the nuclear ecosystem are also involved. China is currently built for China is currently building four Westinghouse AP1000 reactors, which incorporate passive cooling technologies and generation 3 plus safety features. The value of nuclear safety and plant exports is clear. I think we can all agree that the United States is better off without another Chernobyl or Fukushima taking place in Shenzhen or Shanghai. But in addition to that, we ourselves will likely follow China in utilizing these new designs, and as such, we will benefit from their learnings. But what about collaboration beyond the nuclear sphere? Part of the mission of the DOE is to ensure America's energy security, and this requires collaboration with international partners. China is the second largest oil importer in the world, and its natural gas imports are on a steep upward trend. It is against this backdrop that in 2009, President Barack Obama, Obama and Chinese President Hu Jintao announced the launch of the U.S.-China Shale Gas Resource Initiative with the goal of sharing information about shale gas exploration and technology to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote energy security, and create commercial opportunities. In April 2010, the U.S. Department of State launched the Unconventional Gas Technical Engagement Program, or UGTEP. Great name. <laughs> um, okay. in, in order to help countries seek, seeking to utilize their unconventional natural gas resources to identify and develop them safely and economically. Governments often have limited capability to assess their own country's shale gas resource potential or, on uncle or are unclear about how to develop shale gas in a safe and environmentally sustainable manner. We have an environmental and commercial interest and helping them establish the right regulatory policy and fiscal structures. UGTEP uses government-to-government -government policy engagement to bring the U.S. federal and state government's technical expertise 
regulatory experience, and diplomatic capabilities to help selected countries, including China, understand their shale gas potential. U.S. government agencies that partner with the U.S. Department of State under UGTEP include the U.S. Agency for International Development, the U.S. Department of Interior's U.S. Geological Survey, the Department of Interior's Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Regulation, and Enforcement, Department of Commerce's Commercial Law Development Program, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Department of Energy's own Fossil Energy Program. A benefit of this government-to-government -government cooperation is the potential for establishing and strengthening long-term working relationships as the at the technical and ministerial levels. China's potential for exploiting unconventional natural gas resources is very large, and if done properly, swapping shale gas for coal could significantly reduce CO2 emissions. This could represent an environmental benefit for all of us, as carbon dioxide released from a Chinese power plant knows no national borders. On the flip side, considering the scale of trade between the US and China, in everything from electronics to vegetables and fish, a botched effort at developing shale gas resources could easily have health effects that extend into the US. Finally, this is a significant business opportunity for US companies with expertise in shale gas technology. The US-China Clean Energy Research Center is another joint initiative that seeks to leverage combined capabilities of our two nations' treasuries and academic institutions. Announced in 2009, it pairs West Virginia University, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and the University of Michigan with Chinese academic and government institutions to conduct synergistic research into clean vehicles, clean coal, and energy efficiency. But US-China cooperation is not limited to energy. NOAA and the Chinese Meteorological Association cooperate in areas <coughs> ranging from improved <coughs> weather forecasting to measuring global concentrations of greenhouse gases. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is collaborating with the Chinese in areas including biotechnology, natural resource management, food safety, water use, and forestry management. The EPA and China are working together to address water pollution, air pollution, solid waste issues, and PCBs in China's soil. They are also cooperating, cooperating to shut down China's remaining plants that produce CFCs to safeguard the ozone. The U.S. and China are conducting joint epidemiological research on AIDS, pandemic influenza, SARS, and enterovirus 71, and to set standards for the safe movement of food and people across our borders. From this list of activities, I think it is fairly clear that the scope of the problems <coughs> facing our world do not respect borders. There is one ocean and one atmosphere which are part of a common biosphere. There is one atom, an infectious, infectious disease, knows no boundaries. The flow of goods and people across borders ensures the linkage of our two societies in areas of climate, food safety, and public health. U.S.-China relations have progressed considerably since the original SNT agreement was signed in 1979. Indeed, in recent years, China and the U.S. have sometimes been referred to as a G2 for the simple reason that no global issue can be addressed without action by these two superpowers. And once the US and China are on board, there is a good chance that global progress will follow. While some see the US-China relationship as competitive, a more nuanced view of the world recognizes the complexity in our ongoing interactions. Just as there can be gains from trade, the US can profit from its scientific collaboration with China, and indeed it does. All right. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'd actually neglect at the beginning to, to tell you guys that I, 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 for the last couple of years, we've been doing a project called Cooperative Competitors, and our funder has, again, Blue Moon Fund has said, keep on doing it. And, um, but we're going to be not just doing meetings like this in D.C., but trying <coughs> to go out into working, bringing kind of subnational partners together. So, Fantastic. but no, but it's, it's really, it's kind of, because as you were talking, because that's been so much of my work here is following the trail, but you said some things I didn't know, so yeah. I appreciate I'm that. I'm sorry about that. No, it's good. No, I mean, that's why I have these <laughs> meetings. I, I mean, how do I learn these things except absorb it from the smart audience and speakers? All right. He's had, it's like you got, it's, it's always nice when everyone kind of segues into each other. He, he well, gave you a lot it. to play okay. with. Okay. Is this mic on? Yeah. This yes. mic is on. Okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It's really a privilege to be here, and I, it's great to be back on a, on a podium with uh, with Joanna. She and I worked together on a Asia Society 
a roadmap for U.S.-China collaboration on energy and climate. And as I look back at what uh, particularly Joanna was the one that came up with a lot, I think some seven areas of cooperation, as I recall, they're pretty well reflected in the uh, November 16, uh, uh, 2009 joint uh, communique or joint statement, I think it was called by who and, and President Obama. And uh, the, uh, the co-chair of that effort that we did with the Asia Society was Levi's boss, Steve Chu. And uh, John Holdren was involved. It was quite a, an effort, and I think it, it really did show uh, you know, uh, ideas that could be germinated in the uh, sort of track two era that actually go into the uh, uh, administration and make an, uh, have an impact. What I would like to – these talks were great, and I love the way uh, if I ended his talk because it sort of picks up where I want to go. Um, I've been working U.S.-China stuff for about, I don't know, 40 years, something like that, too long. And been going to China for more, more than 30. Um, but I've also been working with the National Intelligence Council on the long term global trends. And, and I want to point that out because I think the efforts where I'm trying to do now with the Chinese is, is, is really a joint assessment of global trends. Um, it, as it is, we see the trends pretty much the same. It's sort of like the, you know, like gravity. You can't have a different view of gravity. Gravity's gravity, right? Although I know there are some people in Congress might want to repeal that law, uh, and then followed by the second law of thermodynamics. We'll get rid of that one too. Um, in any case, uh, there is a common sense of what these global trends are, and the idea is to put that as a larger context for the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, so, to, to, and I will elaborate a little bit on this, but just put it bluntly: if the U.S. and China can't cooperate on all the things that the both of you have laid out, uh, we're going to have a pretty bad century because we're the, we're the two big players. We're the ones that have the biggest impact, obviously, on climate change itself. We're the ones that can make the biggest difference both directions. But there's a whole range of issues that if we can't collab collaborate, I think that this is going to be a very difficult century indeed. And that's why we passed out this, uh, there's this global trends report done by the National Intelligence Council. I'm not sure how, if everybody here is familiar with it. But the, the NIC is the highest intelligence analysis body of the U.S. government. It provides the national intelligence estimates to the president um, and it, it daily briefs, et cetera. But also has been producing a, a global trends report that's totally unclassified, based on unclassified sources uh, for the last, uh, well, since 97. There's been, this is uh, edition 5.0. There was two, 2010, 2015, 2020, 2025, and now 2030. And we at the Atlantic Council have been part of this for the last seven years, taking the National Intelligence Council around the world to get foreign input into these uh, uh, reports so that they're more of a global report, not just an American view. And something like probably a 1,000 experts easily have been consulted. And we've also, on this last one, done a lot more on technology uh, as a game changer. Now, the reason I, I wanted, I passed out this little uh, le menu. Um, uh, Matt Burroughs, who is the, uh, the genius, who is the author of the Global Trends Reports, was asked to give a briefing to uh, Carl Bildt, the Swedish foreign minister, last about almost a year ago. And he did, it was over lunch, and he didn't want to do PowerPoint and pass around a lot of stuff. So he came up with <laughs> Le Menu with the starters, or the megatrends, the uh, main course of the, uh, the critical game changers, and then the scenarios are, are the dessert, as Matt would say, is only one of those desserts you'd really want to eat. Uh, people have asked for <laughs> beverage menus and prices, but that hasn't we haven't gotten that far on this yet. But this is a good cheat sheet for the uh, for the, the 140 150 page report, which by the way can be downloaded as, a, as an ebook from Amazon or iBooks or whatever, or, or from our website, from the next website. I strongly urge people to look at it. This is a really significant report. It's certainly the most important and the best global trends report in the world. I think from all the work we've done and seen other people do. And it's used by the administration. It comes out every four years after the presidential election, is used to inform the, whatever is a new or returning administration for its strategic guidance for the QDR, for the Pentagon, for the QDDR, for the, the uh, State Department, for, for throughout the government. But it's also translated. In fact, Matt was asked to write a, uh, a, a, the intro for the Chinese version, which will be out very soon. They're already at it, translating it. I imagine it'll be out within, within a month or two. They had translated 2025 and 2020. The Chinese, and we've worked very closely with the Chinese. We've, China's one of the countries we've always taken uh, the draft of the report to to get foreign input. Uh, so this report, I think, is very significant. It does look, try to look out uh, 20 years, uh, just in, in roughly 20 years. And I would say, in, in summary, it's a very grim outlook in many ways, very big challenges. And uh, it tries to, it, and I think that the future uh, has a lot of different ways to go. And that's the value of the scenarios, is to get you thinking 
how there could be different outcomes and for policymakers to try to think about uh, the implications of the policies they adopt today for the long term. Is business as usual going to lead you to where you want to go or if you want to get to a better or different spot, what do you do now to, to try to get there? Uh, so if you look at this report, as I said, there are, are there four uh, starters, which we call the megatrends, are ones that are pretty much certain, you know, 80 percent certain they're going to happen if you look out sort of forecasts. Again, this is not enough to, to predict, but to provide a framework for understanding the trends and factors that are going to shape the world. And those are the individual empowerment was put out as such a, a, a new phenomenon. It's sort of pervasive, and we see it in the Arab Spring and other areas. But boy, with technology and the rising middle class, you see this uh, uh, rising demand of people to, to have a say over their own fate, and they have the tools with social media and other technologies to, to uh, have a much bigger impact. And, but also you see this great diver diffusion of power, not only um, you know, to the emerging states, China, of course, obviously, and India, uh, but you know, now the middle tier states, Turkey and, and uh, South Africa and other countries, uh, but beyond that, to non-state actors, the companies that that uh, Joanna has mentioned are non-state actors, uh, certainly the NGOs, the China Environment Forum. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of non-state actors out there causing trouble or helping change the world for the better. I, I'm not making a judgment here. Uh, no, I am. I'm it's trying, for, to make for the better, <laughs> definitely for the better. Uh, but so this non-state actors, I mean, terrorists are non-state actors too, but there are more and more power in the world and more and more ability to shape the world and less and less ability of nation states to simply control the fate of the world and certainly fewer uh, like the United States having this kind of dominant role it had so much in the past. So this is a real big change. And then you see this, this the, the demography, which rate, relates really more to what we're saying here, is that you have the, not only yet adding, uh, going from 50 percent urban and 7 billion people, or about 3.5 billion people in cities, we're going to over 8 billion people by 2030, maybe we'll peak around 9, 9.5 by 2050, maybe at that point we'll start to see a decline, a lot of different uh, estimates on uh, demography. But you see this huge rising middle class, which is really the critical thing, maybe another 1 to 2 billion people in the middle class by 2030, and of course almost all that will be in the emerging markets or uh, I don't know what we call developing world anymore. I'm not sure when you look at Shanghai, it's kind of hard to be talking <laughs> about the developing, underdeveloped country. Uh, but in any case, you see this huge rise in middle class, which of course relates, relates to huge rise in demand for food, water, and all kinds of energy, other natural resources, putting huge pressure on, on natural resource base of the, of the planet, the ecosystem of the planet, the uh, ecological services of the planet, and of course climate change. So this is going, uh, it's part of the great success of pulling people out of poverty, the reconvergence of the developing world with the developed world after a couple centuries where the developed world just took off like this and the, the developing world basically stagnated. By 2050, we might be back to where the developed, developing world, we call it today, might be 75 percent per capita GDP of the developed world. This is a great success, but it, again, a great cost and potential cost uh, and danger with the resource demands uh, maybe way outstripping supply which can lead, of course, to economic crises with spice, price increases, but also just uh, other areas of conflict. And then you have a lot of uncertainties going forward, and that's what this, the game changers are about. Really, obviously, we've seen great volatility in the global economy, and we have a lot of reasons to expect that that will continue. And the question of global governance uh, is, is a huge question. Do we have the governance institutions to manage the problems we face? So far, it's not a very promising, and it looks even more difficult. And many issues like food, water, and lots of aspects of energy are not even subject to, to any kind of global cooperation or, or governance. And uh, this is likely to become more problematic in the future if it, things go the way they are. And then you have a, a, a real issues of conflict. We've had a great reduction in, in violence overall in the world in the last 10 or 15 years. It's, the number of people dying in conflict is, is hugely reduced as a percentage of the global population. But there are a lot of things that could lead to more conflict, particularly the stresses on societies from climate change, aggravating other factors of uh, failing states. Uh, and of course, we see the, you know, uh, the rise of ideology and, and um, Religious fundamentalism, we know the whole story, of, certainly in MENA and, you know, that parts of Africa, Middle East, uh, South Asia. A lot of reasons to be worried about conflict. Some of it could well be driven by resource uh, demands, certainly around water, uh, food, other, other resources. So we're concerned about a lot of, a lot of reasons to be worried about global instability. And, and then you have things such as an uh, area that I think is most interesting is technology. 
uh, because technology, uh, the pace of technological change is accelerating. There will be more change in the next 15 years than there has been the last 15 years. And if you think about the last 15 years, it's pretty remarkable. If you go to the pre-Internet stage, you can't even, I mean, the world has been totally transformed by the Internet alone and social media. I mean, it's just a different world. For those of us who grew up with dial telephones, uh, you know, and uh, it's, it's an incredible change. But there will be more change, far more uh, dramatic changes, and I won't go into what those are. We've been studying them a lot, and I've been working on it. But they are in some ways very hopeful that there are, many, uh, there are many solutions to the problems we face out there. There's a wonderful book called Abundance by Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler that basically says we can have abundance of food, water, energy, clean, clean environment if we you know, do the following kinds of things and implement certain technologies that are already out there. It's a good antidote to Washington. Silicon Valley is the optimists all the people who think we can solve all these problems are going to change the world, and Washington's all the doomsayers, so, oh, God, the threats are everywhere, and, you know, Syria, Iran, nuclear weapons, oh, my God, you know, everywhere you turn, it's doom. So it, somehow there's a truth in both, and they need to bring them together, which I've tried to do. But, uh, and I think that, you know, what, what Joanna has been talking about on the wind power shows that, you know, there's a lot of effort to do this. Uh, so in any case, uh, without going, and, and I think one other factor we did in this report, which is the first time it's been done, is really to point out the United States is a very uncertain factor. Are we going to get our act together and do the things that we need to do uh, in terms of our fiscal uh, order and our education system, our infrastructure, all the things that, that we have? I, I, my own view is that we have, our problems are so much easier to solve than the Chinese or the uh, Europeans or the Japanese or anybody else. It's just we don't have the political will at the moment to really tackle them, in my view. But the solutions are more uh, doable, shall we say, and identifiable. In any case, the future of the United States is an uncertain factor looking forward. So finally, the, we looked at the different scenarios. And I, I won't go into this in, in any length, but just to say that there's a lot of reason to be very worried that uh, we will not cooperate sufficiently to deal with the problems. We could get well, way overwhelmed by them. Our climate change itself, looking down the road, is, a, is very frightening. Uh, the, the, certainly the scientists, I think, seem to be much more worried than today. Than I mean, the, Joanna's worked on the UNFCC uh, and, and all that, so she's better positioned to talk about this than I am. But my sense is scientists think are more worried today than they were a few years ago, that the, the situation is worsening faster than they expected. And the real fear, I think, is hitting a tipping point where you get very dramatic and, and sudden changes. Certainly ice sheets melting in Greenland or West Antarctica would be rather cataclysmic. So there's the climate change alone is a really serious uh, question mark. But if you look at the, the scenarios, it's just shortened because I know yeah. Jennifer's probably looking at her watch here and I think we better get on to, to discussion. You, it's very hard to find a pathway to a positive future down the road, positive by which I mean that, that the world comes together in some way to move toward a sustainable economic development model, deal with climate change, failing states, proliferation, energy, pandemics, all the whole list that we know that are common problems that no state can solve all by itself or for itself. It's very hard to get a pathway to that future that doesn't have at its core the U.S. and China figuring out how to cooperate with each other. It's just you can't get there because the footprint of both countries is just too big. You can't have just the United States and Europe and Japan cooperating or, uh, and then solve all these problems. You can't. So that's at least how I see it, and I think pretty much that's how the report comes down in the, the scenario of fusion where the U.S. Where maybe it takes a crisis to produce it, but we really get serious about cooperating. The, the hopeful side of it is that it, it is, Levi has pointed out, there's this huge infrastructure that's been built over 40-some years. Of, of cooperation and, and uh, between the U.S. government and the Chinese government on all these areas of, of energy, environment, uh, you know, disease, all kinds of things, between universities and individuals and companies. I mean, there's a huge positive infrastructure for cooperation. But we can't ignore the fact that there also is a very deep suspicion between the two countries. There's growing potential for military competition. Uh, there's a, a lot of dangers out there just in the U.S.-China relationship alone. And uh, it's my view that you've got to get the leaders to get control of this and say, hey, wait a minute, there's too much at stake here. Our own national security and prosperity is very much tied to the national security and prosperity of China and the two of us working together to solve global problems. You, you're really stuck. There tends to be a lot of schadenfreude here, and I think in China, when the other one stumbles on whatever it be, particularly economically. But if you really look at the studies, McKinsey's done some very interesting studies for the NIC. 
the best global economy, where we're doing the best in terms of GDP growth, China's doing the best, and the world's doing the best, is when the United States and China are each doing well and cooperating. If either one of them falters, it hurts the other. That is to say, in my view anyway, the biggest threat China poses to us is if it fails, and the biggest threat we pose to them is if we fail. We need each other to succeed, and we need to work together. And it's going to be very difficult because the differences are huge. We have all the IPR problems, all these you know, difficult problems to solve. Uh, we're actually doing very well in Taiwan, but now we've got the Senkakus, or Dao Yudao, depends on your point of view. We've got the South China Sea. We've got all these issues. Uh, and they're not being managed terribly well, in my view. Uh, and so it's not certain where we're going to go. But if we don't get the bigger picture right and the real commitment at the top, and I think when, when Joanne and I were working on this project with the Asia Society on the roadmap, I think one of our, our, our key f things we felt was that you needed the commitment at the very top, the two presidents or the, two, the leadership of the two countries to say, do it, cooperate, work on these things together. They're too vital. Because you put it in the middle levels, they'll find all the reasons they can't. And we'll have all, you know, the, we have all the IPR problems, we have the trust, all this. There's lots of reasons why we can't cooperate. But if you don't make a commitment at the top, those re and those reasons will then really tend to predominate. So you need the leadership and you need ultimately to pull the public behind you. Uh, and just to finish, that, the project I'm working on with the Chinese, because they, they decided to do their own Global Trends 2030 report as a, stimulated by us. In fact, as we went around the world, we tried to encourage countries to do their own work in this area, both to learn from each other and collaborate on these things, but also uh, to encourage countries to take a long view. And ironically, the Chinese, <laughs> for all the, the assumption that China looks out 500 years, 50 years, they've always got this long-term coherent strategy, and us stupid Americans, you know, we can't think beyond the next week. Uh, well, that's a little bit, you know, you talk to the Chinese that way, and they kind of laugh. You know what I mean? They never had done global trends kind of reports. They Chinese never look, look at, you know, I mean, just to, the Chinese are looking back to history, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they didn't have, so they're trying to build this capacity, and, and uh, uh, Tom Finger, who used to be chairman of the NIC, a China expert, and I were involved in sort of consulting to their efforts. So we decided, based on the report that the NIC was doing, the report they're doing, to do a collaborative project with China to see if we could agree on what the global trends, basic trends are and their implications, and then try to make that a framework for the relationship and say we've got to manage our differences within that framework because that's the only way we're going to really move forward. So we're, that's it. project is uh, not completed yet, but hopefully will be this spring and we'll present it to the two leaderships. But I think that's the, uh, my best hope at this point is to get that larger framework so that you get the commitment of the leaderships to say this is important, and then you have this wonderful infrastructure that Levi, you know, detailed. Uh, that's really incredible that's gone on between the two countries, and let's make that the dominant factor of our relationship. Because you have this, on the security level, all the suspicions, all these dangers, on the economic, and you have all this positive stuff, and it's almost like two different worlds going on at the same time. It's, it's almost schizophrenic, because one's leading towards a you know, very dangerous direction, the other one's leading to a very positive cooperation. So with that, I will turn Thank it over you. to you. Well, applause for this man. <clears throat> I, I have to think, it, I know about three Cheng Yus in Chinese, and one is from David Lampton's book, The Tong Chuan Yi Meng, right? The Same Bed, Different Dreams, talking about U.S. China relations. But in some ways, Joanna, you know, at least from the business world, I don't know. And, you know, there's, there's kind of a sense up here on the panel that, that maybe it's the same bed and some similar dreams in terms of energy cooperation. Let's open it up before I destroy any more Chinese Cheng Yu. Um, <clears throat> Um, <laughs> Tyler's got a microphone and he'll he'll pass it to you and please say your name and we got a lot I'm sure we got a lot of questions and I'm waiting for uh, the people from Enroll we're going to email in a question too so we'll let them oh. give them the form. Hey, I'm Helen, Helen Rafael with Resources of the Future. Joanna, a couple of weeks ago I went to a talk at Georgetown University in which you were the main speaker about your book and there was a State Department guy there as commentator and I spoke to him about why cooperation isn't the basis for innovation, for advancement in combating global warming. And his answer was that it's competition that breeds innovation, that you have to have the search for profits that will immediately speed up the uh, advanced advancement of uh, methods for combating global warming. Now, I, I didn't hear a response because the moderator immediately called on other people for questions, but I'm wondering if you <laughs> two or three wouldn't talk about how cooperation 
instead of keeping people laid back because there's no incentive to profit from it, uh, you know, it financially, uh, is, is much more important than competition, which tends to keep things close to the, to the chest and not spread the advancements quickly around the world. Yeah, okay, Joanna. Hey. Yeah, okay. give it an answer. I'm just going to give the mic to someone else. Um, I'm happy to start, and maybe the panelists would like to add. I mean, I, I think that you need both yeah. is the, the, the short answer. I mean, um, there's, you know, competition, I think, can uh, breed innovation, but I think that – I think there's very interesting models of cooperation which are taking place, and I think that as long as you can – make all the partners involved, and when we talk about cooperation here, I'm talking specifically about uh, cooperation maybe between the U.S. and China, for example, to develop uh, new clean energy technologies or to demonstrate technologies or, or begin to deploy technologies at scale. I think that um, what you really need is, uh, I think the role that the two governments can play is to set up a framework that provides trust in whatever both are bringing to the table, right? So I think that there's there's actually, um, uh, you know, I think the the U.S. China Clean Energy Research Center, which Levi briefly mentioned, is a extremely interesting model um, of cooperation between the two countries, and and a really a new model because, um, you know, there's three technology focus areas. There, you know, they're looking at advanced coal technologies, vehicle technologies, and building technologies. But within each of these areas, there's uh, hundreds of projects taking place and many, many partners involved in, in these consortia. Um, and I think the reason why um, cooperation can come from this um, without this sort of competitive tensions is because you have um, an overarching agreement, a technology management plan, which worked out a lot of the IP issues so that the researchers involved don't have to think about it. Um, they can, you know, come to the table, they can be assured that their background IP and things are protected, and they can really focus on um, on on working together. And and so I think you need both because I, I you know I think that we live in a world where um, you know there are uh, you know unfortunately uh, you know situations with IP theft, and I think that sometimes you have companies that. Uh, are, you know, for example, are nervous to go to China. I should say it's not one-sided. There's many Chinese companies that have IP they would like to protect, and I think we've seen a lot of progress uh, within the Chinese legal context in terms of protecting IP and, and providing uh, protections for their own companies because they now have IP they want to protect, and, and this, is, this is something that, um, you know, is, is relatively new in, in the, the sort of broad scheme of things. China's own national innovation system is, is evolving quite substantially. So, you know, I think there, there, there's both. I think it's, it's a long conversation, but, um, but maybe other panels like that? Or, or? Um, yeah, sure. I think that's true. I think you have to have both. I would agree with Joanna. In terms of competition, you need policy structures that are going to incentivize the kind of innovation that we need to transform our world from an ener energy perspective. But the but situation that could spread around the world. Right. Well, <laughs> so the question is, where is that technology going to come from? How are you going to incentivize people to create it? Um, I used to have a clean tech startup myself, <laughs> and uh, I did that for a number of years, and uh, we had a lot of patents. I have a bunch of patents, and let me tell you, if you told me when I was a clean tech entrepreneur, you have to just go and give this to the Chinese for free, it would not have been very incentivizing. So I think that we have to make sure that there is protection of intellectual property rights, and that there is opportunity to profit from that for our companies and entrepreneurs, <laughs> but I will say, um, that the Department of Energy is working assiduously to encourage more cooperation on a positive technology agenda with partners around the world. One of the things we do uh, is called the Clean Energy Ministerial. And what that does is bring toge together energy and environment ministers from around the world. And we have specific technology topics that we outline in advance. And then we also invite industry leaders and have a series of roundtable discussions to figure out how we can speed deployment, collaboration, and cooperation in clean energy. And I think that's the kind of positive agenda that is extremely helpful 
to encouraging the cooperation that you're discussing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just, you had a quick comment too? Yeah, well, I just want to add two things. One is I think that, that you raised the critical role of government, which is a big subject of debate in this country. But government can play a huge role in the R&D. Uh, Dan Poneman, one of your colleagues, uh, pointed out at a recent conference that the, I think the U.S. Uh, DOE put $137 million into fracking research between 78 and 91. People don't seem to realize a lot of what the business is doing now to capitalize on Fracking came out of U.S. government R&D and certainly, you know, the DARPA net leading to the Internet, the computer chip, all this. So government can play a very big role in helping get the R&D going, setting out the incentives. And then, of course, there's tax incentives, all that. So and this, then, then it's the global regime of where you protect your IPR, the common rules of the game that sets the competition out there but incentivizes it and protects it. But the bigger issue, too, that I want to just point to is that if you look at the, the world we're facing, we could divide really degenerate into a zero-sum world, where instead of nations emphasizing the cooperative side of the agenda, it's really the competitive and, and, and each nation for itself, which we almost saw in 2008, came very close to that kind of a, each country looking out for itself, bringing the whole system down. And we could end up in a world of scarcity, a world of, of a real serious zero-sum competition that would be extremely dangerous. The other side, again, if you looked at that fu fusion scenario, that says that we have global cooperation in science and technology to really address climate change and other big challenges. So how do you orchestrate that? But it's really critical. And we have the problem of the national, we want our country to be the most competitive and make sure we protect our IPR, our inventions, our science. Yet scientists want to collaborate internationally to solve a problem. Scientists say, we've got a climate change problem. Anybody that can contribute to understanding it or solving it, you know, wherever you are, let's get together and do it. So that tension is always going to exist. Every country wants to maximize its own uh, GDP, its own advantages, and yet we need to actually co cooperate globally to solve the problems. How we're going to do that is, is uncertain, but it certainly should be understood to be that kind of a problem so that maybe we face it and do it in a constructive way. Cooperative competitors, balancing act. Yes, sir. Brian Holly with U.S. Department of Energy. And I wanted to piggyback a little bit on the last question and, and go back to a uh, point that you made on uh, Dr. Garrett on the implications really of the internet and how that's changed things so much. And I was really intrigued by a TED talk I had seen a few years ago on open source design to do a, a community development kit. And it's always sort of stayed with me and I'm wondering how can we tap uh, the ingenuity of, of the public with the proliferation of the internet to do open source designs maybe on some of the high tech or uh, the high potential technologies that you've uh, captured in this in this global trend study. So are there certain areas, maybe it's it's basic wind power, it's not the latest, greatest stuff, but could we do open source designs that could be easily built around the world to get things at scale, tap the ingenuity of people from around the world and, and A, you know, where are we at with that and B, how do we how do we use that to make a big dent in, in these challenges that we see? Thank you. I would like to respond to that. I think it's a, a very good point. And we are seeing a real uh, change. I don't know how many of you are familiar with 3D printing, additive manufacturing, but this is really, uh, I put a lot of effort in that, work with people on that a lot because I saw it as a real game changer for the, the world. It has huge uh, positive implications for a lot of this. But you're also seeing part of that is the DIY movement, the do-it-yourself movement. I mean, you got tens of thousands of home 3D printers now, and people are inventing stuff, making stuff. They're going, we went, you know, we're, we're digit, going from digits to, to atoms, or bits to atoms, as uh, one MIT guy puts it. Uh, basically, now you can design, anything you can design on a computer, you can actually make, right? You can just print it, right? And you can share all that. You go to, MakerBot has Thingiverse as a website, and there are 30, 40,000 items up there that you can download, modify, and print them out on your printer. So you, you have this kind of global collaboration now is possible on the, on the, for very cheaply. With, with uh, individuals in their own house can have a, you know, they have, everybody's got a computer and you can buy a printer for $1,000, $2,000. You can start designing and collaborating and uploading and, you know, using the cloud. Uh, there's a huge potential for global collaboration on, on virtually anything uh, with very little investment to get into the game. So if you want to work on designing a better wind turbine, you know, you might get a lot of people to be able to collaborate around the world. You start crowdsourcing problems. You know, let's put it out there. I mean, crowdsourcing is extraordinary and how, what kind of inventions are coming out of that. So uh, I think, and a lot of this is happening without the governments even knowing about it, much less being the ones to sponsor it. Uh, maybe there's a lot of things we could do to sponsor it, to, to organize it better or to set out problems, the challenges. You know, remember SpaceX and 
Peter Diamandis' X Prize, you know, and led to look what it's led to in terms of, uh, you know, space exploration. Uh, there are ways that we could draw on this new capability of people with the internet computing power, the cloud for almost infinite memory and computing power, and then even 3D printers to define something, make it, text, test it, you don't like it, you change it, make it again, and you send that SDL file. Well, you, you, you know, everybody now knows you can, you know, you write up your report, make a PDF, you send it to somebody else on the other side of the planet, and in a few minutes they print it out, it looks exactly like what you just did, and yet you just sent bits over the internet to them. Now you can send bits that are a design of a, of a, of a thing, you know, and then the person prints out the object at the other end. So you can, you know, do this instantly all over the world. STL files are like PDF files. And, and, you know, I design something, a pen or something, and then somebody prints it out at home. This is going on and going to be far more, and it's going on at the local level, but it's also working on printing, you know, uh, EADS wants to print wings to airplanes, and they're printing human organs. I mean, it's a general purpose technology that is absolutely <laughs> phenomenal, the scope of it, and the impact it will have. It will change. It's a third industrial revolution. It's going to move to just-in-time production at the point of consumption vastly decreasing the amount of resources used because there's almost no waste in the process. You don't move products around the world, you move STL files, and then you produce them where they're needed. And you design them to fit the needs of the local, the individual customer or the community that wants it. So, I mean, that's a kind of metaphorical for the, your question because it's a broader question. How do you share innovation in urban? I mean, that's one thing I didn't mention. I think that, that uh, you know, the, the two big tech blinders of foreign policy community, and I sit here in the very heart of it, right here in Washington, D.C., in the Wilson Center. Uh, but there's two big blinders for foreign policy people, generally speaking, technology and urban. They don't know about it, so they don't include it. It doesn't matter. Yet nothing is going to change their, their environment, their global operating environment for foreign policy, defense policy, security, intelligence, uh, then technology over the next 15 years, and then urban. We're going to add 3 billion people to cities. We're going to build more city in the next 40 years than all of human history. How we do that is going to be absolutely critical to whether we make climate change worse or help resolve it, how we do with food, water, energy, governance, uh, creativity. I mean, all the things come together in cities. Or as I like to see, you know, Willie Sutton, the bank robber, was asked, you know, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, well, that's where the money is. And I say, why do you focus on cities? Well, that's where the people are. And we're going to have, you know, we have 50 percent of them now, and it's going to be 75, 80 percent by, by 2050. How we do that is going to be critical. So how do we learn from the mistakes and, 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 and uh, valuable lessons of, country, you know, of, of communities around the world? And how they do things, you know, waste management, transit, ma you know, land management, how do you build vertically, you know, energy efficiency. New York City is the most energy efficient city in the United States, by far. And people live longer by three years in New York City. Interesting, isn't it? Um, so, I mean, how do we do this right? We're going to have to share at the local level, you know, at all levels to get it right. Governments aren't going to get it right. Governments tend to hate cities. I mean, it's amazing. Governments are, tend to be anti-urban, the people in the governments. And they don't realize cities are your future. 85% of global GDP comes from cities. 600 cities produce 60% of global GDP with 20% of the world population. 70 per, use 70% of our energy and like, well, and I mean, directly, yeah. I'm trying to wrestle with numbers, something like, Tyler, wasn't like 28% of the world's water, but that's maybe more direct and God knows the embedded water in the food and whatnot, but. Um, but you double the size of a city and you double its GDP per capita plus 15 percent, and you double its resource consumption minus 15 percent. So cities, both in the developing world and the developed world, according to Jeff West, are basically, you know, they're more energy efficient and more productive. So cities are your future, and we getting them right is everything. Getting them wrong is a disaster for the world. And China's getting them wrong in a lot of ways. New book out on China's trying to build Los Angeleses all over, and I was born in L.A. No, and believe me, you don't want to duplicate that. Uh, anyway, so, but I mean, I, I think you, you point to something that's very important, and I don't think Washington gets it yet. I'm glad DOE gets it, but uh, maybe not. But he asked, Washington. come on, you don't know the I know. audience here. But anyway, long-winded answer, Gra sorry. Graham Smith. Hi, I'm Graham Smith. Uh, used to be full-time with the World Bank, now I'm occasionally with the World Bank as a consultant. Um, I read yesterday that Nick Stern is very worried about the uh, pace at which uh, climate change is, is evolving, and he's somebody I respect greatly. Uh, he was uh, chief economist at the EBRD when I was there in the early 90s, and then uh, chief economist at the World Bank more recently, and then more recently than that, uh, a chief economic advisor to the British government. Um, 
it uh, brings to my mind that in the last year or so, I've seen a word I hadn't seen used previously, and that's resilience. And I wonder what implications we draw from that. Um, certainly, it would seem to me that uh, the cities are the largest of cities worldwide are um, on coastlines at low elevation and very vulnerable to major increase in, in uh, uh, ocean levels. Um, does this mean that uh, to be resilient we have to uh, focus on major changes or is it more, since we don't know exactly where the damage is going to occur, do we have to be flexible and uh, give preference to um, agile solutions rather than capital-intensive infrastructure-based solutions. Um, the word scenario I first learned in 1975 when I was working in Tehran under the Shah's regime as a uh, part of a uh, consulting firm charged with coming up with a master plan for highways in Iran in the year 2000, 25 years in the future, <laughs> when the Shah hoped that the U.S. would have achieved uh, U.S. level uh, levels of, of income, and uh, we were paired with a, a French company that introduced the technique of scenario planning. Well, we tried to be innovative as to how Iran's economy was going to evolve. We did not for a moment envisage the Ayatollah scenario. So it taught me that uh, resilience is indeed uh, extremely important. I think that we are able to respond to things that we don't know yet what we will have to respond to. But I welcome your thoughts. My thoughts? Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to start. Uh, I think Banning is the, the long-term strategic thinker at, at the table. Um, but, uh, but I like that we're, we're covering everything from 3D printing to, to climate resilience in, in this Citizen conversation. Citizen science. Yes. And <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I think that China is an interesting case in thinking this through because, um, as you may know, I mean, within China, there it's a very different um, way, I think, of, of thinking about climate change from policy perspective than we have here in the U.S., where the science has not been questioned. Um, I think there's a lot of science coming out of China uh, showing the vulnerability uh, that uh, China faces in, uh, with, as climate change progresses. And I think that one of the real uh, problems is that it's, it's you know, what the, the security community frequently refers to as a threat multiplier, but it really, many of China's already, you know, their, their sort of weaknesses, uh, water um, scarcity, uh, agricultural, you know, sort of sensitivities um, are all likely to be uh, exacerbated uh, under uh, under climate change, and I think that you you have this other situation where, uh, not unlike in the U.S., um, although even more more so, uh, China's eastern coastline, where the majority of the people live, the majority of the economic growth is of course occurring, is very susceptible to sea level rise, encroaching storms, severe weather events. Shanghai, primarily, you know, uh, under sea level or you know barely above sea level. Um, you, there's a lot of, I think, really interesting thinking. Um, I'm doing some work right now on, on China's adaptation planning, and um, within Shanghai, they're doing a lot of, I think, interesting ways of thinking about developing um, the city to become more resilient to flooding, to storms, um, because they, they recognize uh, the sensitivity. The, the Shanghai municipal government and the mayor there has really been, I think, leading on this. Um, for a long time, not just because of climate change, but because of the, the sort of the broader, um, the broader uh, vulnerabilities that that, that you know, huge urban uh, center faces. So I think that you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting lessons coming out of how China is approaching uh, adaptation to climate change that, that you know, U.S. eastern coastal cities uh, may want to look at as well. Is there is there very much? I, I haven't really heard like I've heard like the NGO community, like you know, WI and others. The Brits are working in China on adaptation and resilience kind of issues. But is the U.S. government, do we work with China on, on this kind of issue? Like, I mean, the you know, Shanghai sinking, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, disaster I, mitigation. We do work together with the Chinese on a lot of issues, and this would be encompassed in some of those issues. Um, I can just say from a U.S. government perspective, we are increasingly witnessing a convergence between energy, water, and resilience planning. I mean, people have realized that the climate shift has in many ways sailed. And the only way that we're going to be able to deal with this is to attack it from numerous angles at the same time. We have to reduce 
our greenhouse gas emissions. We have to increase the resilience of our cities, um, and we have to we have to make them flexible but hard at the same time. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. So, for instance, um, in uh, a, a month ago in the New York Times, there was a column about a smart grid that had been built in the Midwest, and a huge storm came through and would have wiped out power for millions of people, but because the grid was smart and hard, it was able to reroute electricity appropriately within seconds, and an outage that could have been days ended up being you know, 60 seconds, and the situation was fixed. So there are ways that we can make our system, our system smart and hard at the same time, and I think that's the direction we have to go in. I want one of those systems here in the DC yeah. area. Thank you. Yeah, it's, well, it's interesting <laughs> because traditionally you've had to, uh, much of the smart grid investment went towards the southeast mm -hmm. where they have had the most hurricane activity mm -hmm. um, historically. But with climate change, that activity is migrating. We're getting much more intense storms farther up the east coast. So we're going to have to build those systems in DC. I mean, those of you in DC, you remember the derecho last summer, right? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> but so, well, Sandy should have been a, a big wake-up so, yeah. call. But well, I mean, there is the issue of what you do save. I mean, I, I, my wife and I love the Outer Banks, in North Carolina, but you know, how much do you keep rebuilding? I mean, do you get cut, in, you know, across? The, you know, build a new bridge and then it gets wiped out. And, and, I mean, is that still going to be there? Is that viable? You know, and, and so what do you actually try to put a lot of money? The, the, the Japanese built those 10-meter high walls for that one village, you know, and and and. They predicted you know, the worst case was a 30-foot uh, tsunami, and it was 30 foot. They got it exactly right, except the land dropped by six inches, and it went uh, right over the top. So, I mean, how much do you keep, like in New Orleans, what part of New Orleans are you going to keep protecting? So that, those are really tough questions. Uh, the longer-term question to me is, can we build a, a much more you know, resilient society or global system where it, that, that mitigates carbon and, and uh, resource is far, far more resource productive. And if you look at a kind of decentralized world where you have just-in-time printing, as I mentioned, of products, you make your products locally and use local resources, far lower carbon footprint, far more productive of the use of the resources. If you have energy that's produced more locally, that is particularly wind power and solar power, which people always forget to, to point out the obvious, that the fuel is free forever. Having lived next near a coal plant south of, old, uh, of Reagan, where those tr those trains come in year after year for 65 years until they just shut it down, hauling that coal, right? you're going to tell me that's really better and more economical than getting free wind, free uh, fuel forever. But anyway, you decentralize production of energy closer to where it's consumed, and then working on vertical farms. And we're having a workshop in a couple of weeks on uh, cultured meat that you can actually grow meat, bioprint meat. Instead of, you know, the agriculture is like 24% of global emissions. <laughs> you, you don't, you know, if you had 9 billion people all eating meat, where we get 257 pounds of, of meat per person in the United States, it ain't going to happen. You, you'd have the whole planet would be, be nothing but livestock feed, feed lots. You can't do it. So there are, you know, if you did, but you do that, that you reduce the stress on water, on land, you, you're, you're more uh, resilient to the impact of climate change. If you have vertical farms where you're growing food in, in skyscrapers in the cities, 24-7, it doesn't matter what happens with drought or anything else. It's more energy efficient, far less water used, and it's grown where it's going to be, be consumed. So you can envision another way you organize society globally that actually might work which would be far more resilient because you're not dependent on a global system. It goes down and then everything goes down. It's like the Internet itself was built to be highly resilient with all these nodes and no one central point. So you can envision another future, which is part of what we should be doing as we try to build out and think about how we, how we, the decisions we make today, where they're leading, and what the technologies are and techniques and organizational principles that could guide to a very different uh, you know, deal with the big challenge of the century, which is sustainable, low-carbon development. If we don't get that right, probably nothing else is going to matter. And we need wind power for that. Yeah, absolutely, you need wind Joanne, power. Did you have we any need idea? Joanna telling us how we're going to do it globally. Some other questions. Oh, we need to grab a mic because there's the webcast folks who might be sad if they don't hear it. <clears throat> and say who you are, please. Hi, I'm Cecilia Springer with RFF and Climate Advisors. 
Um, I look forward in the near future when we can download Chinese wind turbine designs and print them out here. Um, but <laughs> given the more traditional export logistics of today, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on your comment that Chinese wind technology export is really not at the level that we're seeing in other sectors. Um, is this a problem similar to the one that faces solar with um, international trade problems and tariffs, or is it more of a markets and demand problem? I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on that and where you think it's going. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Um, yes, I too look forward to a day where we can print out <laughs> <laughs> print out a wind turbine. and wind turbines. Okay. <laughs> it's working on that big. GA is doing that big time, actually. I've, I've used a fair amount of 3D printing, and let me tell you, we are not quite there yet. It, yeah. is, it is a great technology with great <clears> potential, <throat> but you can't print out anything and use it. You can print out models of things and understand. Uh, I, I disagree with that. Actually, okay. Boeing's printing uh, out. Let's not get into a debate of the Dreamliners on this. Printing. <laughs> We're not printing out our lunch today. But Joanna. not on these little printers. Joanna. On the big ones. Um, the question, yes. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, there's a several reasons why I think we haven't seen the scale of exports uh, of wind turbines coming from China as we have in, in solar and other areas. And the simple explanation is that uh, there's been such a huge market within China for wind that um, there's been such a need for it there that it, it was a supply-demand issue that most of the Chinese wind turbine manufacturers sprung up to supply for the domestic market. Um, there were all these policies in place, feed and tariffs, et cetera, um, and other policies I didn't talk about, which encouraged uh, research development, deployment, demonstration by Chinese wind turbine manufacturers. Um, in solar, it's, uh, there is now a feed and tariff for solar in China, but that didn't go into effect until several years later. Um, and policies to support solar domestically in China are relatively new. Um, and this, partly, this mostly reflects the price. Uh, the respective price of the two technologies where wind has been, within the Chinese context, much more cost competitive with alternative technologies. Um, coal, of course, being the, you know, very inexpensive in China, but uh, not including, of course, the environmental costs. Um, but uh, even taking into account the transportation issues, for example, as, as Banning mentioned in, in Alexandria, this is a much a larger problem in China where most of the coal resources are not located near uh, the demand, and so there's a lot of uh, bottlenecks in shipping coal around the country, powder outages, et cetera. Um, and within this frame, you, I think it's been interesting to see just in the last year or so within China push towards more decentralized uh, power. Uh, China, of course, uh, like the U.S., really sprung up as this very centralized power sector model, large, you know, few large utility, big players, um, centralized power systems, primarily coal-based um, as well as, as hydro and, and, and nuclear being a, a newer area. Um, but because of the, you know, because of, I mean, partly because of the resiliency issue and, and the, the fact that you have, um, you have factories, for example, that have to have back out, backup uh, generators uh, in place because of power outages or even power curtailment, um, which happens particularly in, in the cities in China. Um, they, you know, these backup generators tend to be the dirtiest, uh, and if you have more decentralized sources like solar, um, whether it's on rooftops or, or wherever, you, you obviously have more uh, power near, the, near demand. It's been interesting because you know, the, the policies to do decentralized interconnection for solar in China are really still very much evolving. Um, and there had been, I think, a real pushback by the grid companies about doing this, not unlike yes. in the U.S. because of the complications that that um, creates with interconnection and making sure, you know, large-scale solar on rooftops isn't uh, destabilizing uh, the grid, but, I uh, question, yeah. Joanna? <laughs> Please. So I had heard <laughs> that uh, one of the reasons you don't get more wind power from China in the United States is because uh, the financing is very difficult because companies, uh, large financiers, do not see Chinese wind power as predictable. Mm -hmm. They don't see it as tested, and uh, for lack of a better word, they don't see it as a bankable asset. Mm -hmm. When you get Investus or you get a GE, they are pretty positive that that turbine is going to produce power yeah. in a specific way, depending on the resource, for 20 years into the future. And they just don't have the competence in Chinese technology and uh, the robustness of it. Yeah, I think that there's some truth to that. I mean, part of the problem, though, it's not that Chinese wind turbines are necessarily uh, inferior. I think the problem is these are this is new technology. If you are going to invest in a wind farm that you hope is going to last for 20 or 30 years and you're going to bankroll that project, you want to know that that wind turbine is going to last for 20 or 30 years and you don't have a, a single Chinese wind turbine that's been in operation for 20 or 30 years, particularly a, a, you know, a current utility scale um, model. 
And so, you know, a lot of the, the real, you know, the, the turbines coming out of China, even from the Goldwins and, and the other leading uh, top companies, 1.5, 2 megawatt turbines there, you know, they're, they're just out of the, um, the production line and, and up and running. And so we don't have a lot of operating experience. You have a handful of Chinese firms trying to, uh, to fix that perception. For example, um, Goldwind, you know, was one of the first Chinese companies to really make sure that they got a couple demonstration projects up and running in the U.S. Uh, they had, I think their first wind farm was up in Minnesota, just three turbines, but they put those in as quickly as they could so that they could start running, have the operating experience, and be able to show that to investors. Um, but I think the investment um, piece is, is an interesting one and, and one I won't, I won't go into much, but, you know, a lot of these Chinese wind companies and Chinese companies in general actually come with their own uh, sources of financing. Goldwyn has their own financing arm. Uh, they've received uh, f support from the China Development Bank, among among others. So, you know, a lot of times that's not, I think, a main barrier for, for Chinese expansion. Um, but I think that, you know, as you see this technology operate, as we learn, you know, whether or not it's going to be able to compete, uh, warranties and, you know, operation maintenance um, capabilities are going to play a role here. Joanna, are the grid companies, you mentioned how they're not that keen on the solar, but in terms of the wind power, I mean, you said the connectivity issues are starting to be more resolved. I mean, is that... Did I say that? Did, uh, well, <laughs> well, somebody did. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's not as much garbage wind farms as before, right? Uh, well, yeah, no, they're not garbage wind farms. I mean, I, I think there's some misperception. I mean, the situation in China is not what you had in California in the 1980s, where you actually had tax credits, where you were, you know, being paid to install wind farms, and then you just never connected them to the grid, never generated electricity. Um, that's less the issue in China. It's not a transmission issue. Um, there, there is a lag between when the wind farms are built and when the transmission is built uh, is built out to the wind farms, just because of the scale, the rapid expansion that you've seen in wind in China. Um, but I think the real problem is not is not so much transmission, but inter is a integration into the broader grid. And so this is not, um, you know, wind farms that are never connected to the grid. It's wind farms that are being curtailed. They're they're being kicked offline because of the problems they create. Um, uh, not that I should say that better. <laughs> not that they're creating problems, but because of the, the complications with integrating coal and wind, balancing the load, um, and there's a lot of work happening right now in China um, to really improve the sophistication with, with which the grid companies can do this, putting in place things like forecasting um, of wind so that you know when the wind is going to blow. You can plan ahead. You can, you know, have backup power online. And, and so, there, you know, that's just one example. But um, I think that they're, you know, they are experimenting with wind power development at a scale that we haven't seen anywhere else in the world. So it really is not surprising to me that they are experiencing these major technical <laughs> difficulties because, um, I mean, the, the levels of penetration of wind on the, in certain parts of the Chinese grid we're seeing are much higher than we saw in Denmark um, or other places that have been, you know, previously the, the real centers of, of wind development. So it's just trial and error, but that, that but ostensibly the grid companies are, as they're working it through, I mean, they're open to wind in general? I mean, um, or is I think, it pricing issues? <laughs> I think challenge? increasingly. I mean, I, there's a really interesting, uh, you know, the grid company has to, to deal with this. You know, their job is to keep the lights on, to you know, to provide reliable power. So anything that provides complications, not unlike in the United States, you have the utilities pushing back the same way. Um, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a new policy, for example, a quota program, which the, the central government is, is in the process of, of implementing, which will actually force um, local uh, local level uh, governments to purchase renewable electricity to make sure that the renewable electricity that's being generated from the wind farms actually gets <laughs> absorbed by the grid and utilized. This is, you know, one way that they're trying to um, get around this curtailment issue um, by not allowing the utility to just curtail, but to actually, you know, if you have targets that have to be met in terms of not just capacity, but actual electricity generation uh, from renewables, then you're going to have different incentive structure potentially at the local level. Um, and more pressure put on the grid companies to make sure you, you're not curtailing so much. Some other qu come up here. Let's grab two questions. We'll just gather the, the two up. Not surprising you have a question. Uh, hi, I'm Heidi Wernz, and I'm from the FERC, the FERC. Um, actually, I have a question, but I was just going to make a quick comment to Joanna because what she was talking about is similar to the problems that um, the United States has in the Pacific Northwest, where in Bonneville Power sometimes they've had to curtail wind actually for the sake of the hydro. So there's sort of like a renewable resource conflict out there, um, which is kind of interesting. And also who, who pays 
when there's curtailment. Um, but my question is, it sort of goes to resilience and it also goes to um, having the proper or the optimum resource portfolio. And so I wonder what you see in the future. There's still a number, like China still relies largely on coal. And I wonder if in the future in terms of um, trying to replace coal, would you see more gas like with the frack through fracking or would you, s or, or wind, or how do you see perhaps the story playing out? If uh, like in the United States, for example, about four years ago, we had a big push for have more renewables and then there was expensive transmission being built and then while wow, gas went down and fracking has made gas, suddenly uh, one of our most um, prized resources for the future and gas actually may replace um, some of the wind and solar resources that we thought would be built. So I wonder what you got, all of you actually, what you would think about that. Um, and how would a country go about designing the best policy so you could come out with the optimal mix? Maybe just pass over, just gather this last question here. Uh, can you just ask the question? Oh, we'll sure. do them together. I'm um, sorry. Hi, I'm Bonnie Ram. Um, I wear two hats. I have my own consulting company, and I'm also involved with the Center for Carbon-Free Power Integration at the University of Delaware. Um, one of the things that, um, that strikes me about the technology conversation, and I think, Joanna, you've done a fantastic job of giving us this very complicated story in simple charts and color graphs, um, is that the the blinder, as um, a gentleman was talking about in foreign policy, I think is the social sciences. And, you know, I'm looking at your, your title, Global Transition to a Low Carbon Economy, and I think what's always missing is the conversation on how will social sciences inform this transition, instead of only talking about how great the technology is, or how it transfers, or how, you know, why don't we have, getting back to her question, more wind where we should is because of siting problems, because of the community uh, not either being aware or we don't have the knowledge base, the decision makers or the corporations deploying the wind is not having the conversation with the community in the right way. We can't even have a conversation about climate change here. Uh, <laughs> so how the heck can we talk about portfolio? Uh, and again, the social science scientists are kind of the last resort uh, when it comes into the policy arena. So I'll stop there. Um, um, and just one anecdote for Joanna's benefit is that I was at the China Wind Power Conference, had the privilege of being there, and I was drooling over all the gigawatt deployments and looking at where <laughs> we are and where they're going. Um, and I asked one of the gentlemen, um, the China decision maker on wind, about social sciences and siting. And in particular, I'm interested in offshore wind. And he says, you know what, come back in a couple of years. Uh, when we're going to have the problem. And sure enough, two years later, their marine, uh, I'm not saying the, the name of their agencies that makes decisions on the ocean, they had already decided to do a demonstration project and the marine agency said, eh, we have security issues there. You got to move over here and then they got to move over there. So all of a sudden they had a siting problem. And, yeah. um, <laughs> but we don't talk about that even at the Department of Energy very much. Thank okay. you. Okay. So real quick responses, Joanna, starting, I think, you know, with uh, Heidi's. I'll start. Okay. Yeah. Um, Optimal resource portfolio. I mean, I think that's a it's a it's an interesting question, and it's certainly one that um, is is very much still I think up for discussion. Uh, you know, right now, primarily coal dependent, a fair amount of hydropower, and there's a lot of interest in how much gas can be scaled up in China. I mean, I think it's interesting that um, you know Levi mentioned that gas could really play an important role in substituting away from coal, um, but if China's you know growth in energy demand is stays at the rates that we've seen, it's not necessarily substituting, right? It's just sort of helping to fill in this incremental demand. You're not talking about shutting down coal plants yet in China, right? Um, and, you know, we haven't talked a lot about carbon capture and sequestration today, um, but of course this is another technology which would potentially, you know, allow China to continue its, you know, large-scale use of fossil fuels, but, you know, still while China is one of the few countries in the world that's actually starting to demonstrate these technologies, you know, it's still relatively cost prohibitive until you have a real price on carbon. Another thing that China is actually starting to do, right, um, with their pilot cap and trade systems. Um, and nuclear is the other one, um, which is just starting at such a small base in China. So even though China has uh, plans on the books to build more nuclear plants than any other country in the world in the next decade or so, you're still only getting up to a few percent. Um, 
of total demand. So I think it's a scale issue when you talk about China. I mean, and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, it's hard to envision. You know, there have been some studies that have showed that that China actually has the potential to be able to power its entire country by wind. So it is technically feasible. <laughs> is it politically, socially feasible? You know, and all these other issues that Bonnie mentioned, the sort of broader uh, social science framework. These are not in you know insignificant factors, right? I think technical potential only tells us so much. And um, you know, there's been less pushback on siting than China for obvious reasons, but that doesn't mean it's a, not a real issue. There have been, um, you know, reports of environmental re of protests related to wind farm siting, you know, even onshore and then the offshore. It's a somewhat of a different, it's a security issue about sort of who has the rights for these uh, offshore development unless you're putting it on an oil rig as, as they've done as well. So. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you know the, the the future of China's energy portfolio is is, is going to be an interesting question. But I think we're going to see them use basically a lot of everything. So what do you think? Well, Shale gas? I, the <laughs> game changer? That's a big question. No, so I, I think it comes down to two words: um, economics and policy. And really, if economics are right, like they are for natural gas in this country right now, it will just drive other things out of the system. So over the past five years, you've seen an incredible migration away from coal and towards natural gas, um, which depending on what the methane leakage is for natural gas extraction is either a really good thing for CO2 emissions and global warming emissions, uh, or it's just kind of a wash. So we don't really know what the methane leakage is yet. But if the economics are not socially optimizing, then you have to use policy to make incentives for a socially optimized system. And I, I think that's kind of the really simple answer to the question. So it all comes down to economics. Yes, you know, we have the technology here, but if it's not competitive, it's just not going to work. And uh, you need good policy that looks not just at how people can make money, but what's best for the whole society. And then you have to adapt the system uh, through policy. And that's the challenge for the administration now. But what's notable is that, I mean, as, as coal has been going down here, our coal exports to China have increased. And to Europe. And Europe, because China, because China sees the coal not only as coal, but as water. It's virtual water imports, because they have such difficulty getting the coal out of the ground. We actually did for, in our, with my partnership with Circle of Blue, our choke point China, we have a recent report on shale gas, which uh, right now is, it's, it's like, it's not looking as rosy in terms of the short term. And, 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 in, and in talking to Chinese officials, it seems that their interest is less that it replaces coal but that supplies some of those, the heat for those big cities coming, you know, so which again could have a slight displacement of coal, but yeah, it's, it's a big question. Just to note that on March 15th, I've got maybe Joe Shijo mm -hmm. from, uh, used to work at IHS CIRA. My former colleague. Your former colleague, yeah. good. He's coming to town here and we're gonna have NRDC joining him talking about natural gas and shale because to be honest, it's difficult to get our brains around it. So, I mean, I, I hope, and everyone's really interested because it's, but I um, but hope you can come to that too. Final word there on any of this? Just on what you said about uh, understanding how technology gets adopted, who adopts it, who blocks it, how do you do it, I think that that's a really critical set of issues. Intel has done some very interesting work on <coughs> the different ways that, that technology, let's say cell phone, you know, smartphones or internet get adopted in different countries is very different. You have to understand the cultural context if you want to move it forward. Uh, everything from government policy down to the individual users. Uh, interestingly enough, Genevieve Bell from uh, Intel, whom I talked with yesterday, has shown that actually on almost all areas of technology, women are the driving force. I mean, women use, you know, they use Facebook more, they use everything but LinkedIn is used more by women. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very interesting, and they're the real drivers of the technology and its uses. And it, the, the perception, of course, it's all men and the geeky men and all that, but it's actually the women who drive it forward. Very interesting. That's true tr pr virtually, you know, in the United States, but uh, globally. But I mean, it, it relates to that whole question how do you move something forward? Uh, you need the social scientists up there. You need, and she's an anthropologist, by the way. Uh, you need that kind of uh, look at the, at the situation to understand how you actually navigate the human beings that are involved in all this. The technology is just something that we, we've created to, to meet our needs or, or not. Um, and how do we move it forward? So I think that's a really important piece to add to it. I have to say one thing. I've been chairing meetings here for 13 years, and I've never had a meeting that covered so many topics. That we're kind of, but somehow we brought it all back to the wind power, and so it's all, we're going to blame Joanna. 
for a and her book, wonderful book for a wonderful book on innovation. We were very innovative in the discussion, um, but yeah. But so buy her <laughs> it's book. It's your fault. You're it's my me. fault. It's, yeah, it's like I ramble too. So no, no. Yeah. I meant you invited me. <laughs> I, I don't. I'm, I'm a troublemaker. Not having you back, man. Just kidding. Um, no, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, as I meant, uh, keep an eye. If you're not on our mailing list, please give your card to one of my associates assistants out there. Um, yeah, but we've got stuff on shale gas coming. Some Lawrence Berkeley National Lab folks are going to wander by early March as well. And um, yeah, stay tuned. And I've got to give a wave to my funders, Blue Moon Fund, Skull Global Threats from Vermont Law School, USAID, and Rockefeller Brother Fund, because it helps me keep the lights on. And thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> I really like this, because it's been a while since we've had anyone go over.